Can we have the slides? Oh, we've got them. There we go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. Uh, virtually everybody that's appeared in front of you, not just in this session, uh, but the professionals at this meeting, have libraries of thousands, if not tens of thousands, of professional slides. It's a very good discipline that I impose on myself today, and I invite others to contemplate. If you could choose one slide with which to convey the essence of what you think is the, the key of the climate change issue, what would you choose? Well, here's mine. It's a slide of the last 10,000 years, so today is over here, 10,000 years ago along here, and it's the modern warm period that Fred's already spoken of, uh, the modern interglacial, uh, and temperature is on this um, scale, and that's about six degrees, and we see that uh, about 10,000 years ago, temperature was uh, increasing very rapidly, and it was increasing rapidly from uh, off through the floor down there is where the last glacial peak was 20,000 years ago. And Fred has shown you the larger scale diagram where this is going to go off through the floor again to the next glacial peak in about 100,000 years' time. So this diagram, which is an ice core from Greenland uh, and, and which reconstructs in the blue curve the air temperature above the Greenland ice cap, uh, this, this, this is the context against which you have to look at modern uh, temperature measurements. And we see cycles, and the first cycle I've just referred to is the 100,000-year cycle uh, of major glaciations. Uh, the second uh, thing that we see is that there's a, a cooling of about 2 degrees uh, from 8,000 years ago, the period called the Holocene Climatic Optimum, through to today. So the temperature uh, over the last uh, eight, 10,000 years has been cooling, and we sit in that cooling curve. But at a higher frequency, we see these uh, modulations, and the four here have got green stripes, and they are the intermittent little ice ages and medieval or modern warm periods that, again, Fred Singer has already referred to, about uh, 1,500 years apart. Uh, and a magnitude of about two degrees from the warmer peak uh, to the Little Ice Age uh, uh, trough. Uh, finally, we see the, the rise in dotted, um, uh, dotted here because this is data, proxy data from an ice core, and this is passed across from temperature measurements with thermometers. Uh, we see the rise in the uh, 20th century. Now, and that's the context against which you have to uh, think about the changes that are happening today. Now, here we have carbon dioxide, uh, which mixes globally in a year, uh, from an Antarctic ice core. And you see over the 8,000 years, the temperature fell by two degrees. Carbon dioxide rose by 20 parts per million carbon dioxide. And you see there is no close correlation between any of the variations in the carbon dioxide curve and the temperature curve here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the single diagram that gives you the context for the temperature changes and bells the cat with respect to carbon dioxide. It will not surprise you that you have never seen that diagram in the New York Times or even the Wall Street Journal. It is just not part of the public discussion, yet it is the essential intellectual framework for the understanding of changes in temperature. If you look really carefully up here, you can see a bunch of angels dancing on the head of, of the end of the warm 20th century pin. That is the explosion of comment that happened in the blogs in the last two weeks with the new NOAA paper arguing that the, the temperature hasn't paused. And there's now a huge furor and argument going on. It's irrelevant to climate change. You can say nothing about climate change on the basis of 10 or 20 years record. So let the angels have their dance on the pin this is the diagram for context that you need to understand. OK, it's pretty obvious from the variability of, of the temperature through time that we have to adapt to uh, climate change, both warmings and coolings. Uh, we can't predict them in advance exactly. We know they're going to happen, and so we have to adapt. Uh, plan A, the IPCC's plan, was mitigation. Ours now, we understand more about it, and Christopher's just eloquently explained why, is adaptation. 
To show that this is, idea has been around for a long time, this is the title slide of a talk I gave in 2009 at the third uh, um, Heartland Conference. Uh, and then, and now even more, many, many uh, independent scientists and economists and so on will, will take this line, that the plan B we need is one of preparing for and adapting to uh, climate change. OK, well, we go to the IBCC's latest report, the Fifth Assessment Report, and we find no, very little mention of the word adaptation. We rather have this word mitigation, which is human intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. And then in the finer print down here, the ultimate objective is to achieve stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. That would prevent dangerous, and who says what's dangerous, anthropogenic interference with the climate system. This is full of weasel words. <laughs> the whole debate is full of weasel words. They weren't chosen by weasels, they were chosen by radical green environmentalists. All of you and I, every day, are sucked into discussing this issue in the terms the other side wish us to use because of the control of language. If we go back to the 16th century in the United Kingdom, the, the word utopia was first introduced by Sir Thomas More in his famous book, uh, where he described the ideal state, uh, and the ideal governance, and the ideal political systems, and so on you would have uh, in an ideal state. Track forward a couple hundred years to the 19th century, and the famous liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill, and he introduced the term dystopia. And he pointed out that what is commonly called utopian, back here by Thomas More, is something that had come to be viewed as too good to be true or too good to be practical. That was not the original definition, but that's the way it turned out. And vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, Disraeli government's attitude to, to our Irish uh, matters at the time, uh, he commented, uh, but what they appear to favour is too bad to be practical, and this is dystopian, a system that is just too bad to be true. In 20th century, various writers took up this theme, and of course, the one that you, uh, we hear most about uh, is George Orwell. Uh, and he introduced the concepts of double, th uh, double think and newspeak uh, in his famous book, 1984. Orwell believed that double think means holding two contradictory beliefs in mind simultaneously, such as we've often read, cooling is warming and accepting both as true. We thereby become unaware of the discrepancy between truth and falsity. Doublethink mostly stems from a total belief in an ideology. Communism, capitalism, socialism, fascism, any kind of ism is the ism that holds the truth as embedded in the language used. And of course, Steve Gorham has this wonderful phrase, climatism, for the people that I call warmaholics. Thirdly, contrived language, for example, carbon means carbon dioxide, can distort and corrupt our thinking, make us stupidly unaware of lies and fail to question our leaders. Control the language and you control the people, and hence the society, this is the route to dystopia, not utopia. Today we have modern manifestations of these techniques. We've polished them up a bit, but they're essentially exactly as Orwell described them. Uh, modern manifestations include uh, verbal manipulation, cognitive dissonance, the widespread acceptance of spin as legitimate politics, uh, and what are called postmodern and postnormal science. This thing really doesn't want to change, does it? Very little of Orwell's uh, handwritten uh, originals survive, but this is one small part that does. Uh, and down here we see the Ministry of Truth contained. It was said 3,000 rooms, I can't quite read, above ground level, and uh, many more than that below. Uh, and uh, the famous phrase is, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Well, of course, the equivalent is carbon dioxide is soot. <laughs> Extremely likely is 95%. Cooling is warming. Climate is weather. Denier is liar. Skeptic is septic. Social license means green approval and mitigation is prevention. Yeah. 
The immediate intent is to deceive, but the ultimate aim is always to control. I only have time to look at that very last one. In fact, I don't even have that uh, mitigation. If you're going to mitigate something, you, you have to know what, what the future holds. Well, here we go. Let's make it easy. Will 2030 be like the Little Ice Age, cold and Thames frozen over and all that stuff, or will it be like the medieval warm period with peasants dancing in the hay and growing wine in the north of England? Uh, so, reasonable question. Uh, what are we going to mitigate against? Are we going to mitigate against this or mitigate against this? Nobody knows. Nobody on the planet knows. Lots of scientists can get up here and give you reasons why they think one or the other might happen, but nobody actually knows. It's a no-brainer. Even an Australian can work out in that situation. <laughs> In that situation, you have to prepare for either. Mitigation, the IPCC Plan A hasn't worked, it won't work, and it can't work. What is Plan B? Plan B has to be preparation for and adaptation to all extreme climatic events. Every country already has an agency, a civil uh, defense planning agency in the United States, FEMA, which is charged with doing just those things. You probably don't know, and certainly uh, the president doesn't know, uh, but he, last year, in a, a speech at the Calif University of California, uh, made the following comment. Instead of waiting for catastrophe to hit, uh, the Obama administration says it will dole out a billion dollars for a resilience fund to prepare for and adapt to climate change. Every country in the world is going to end up with this policy. It's the only practical policy. The United States has actually got world leadership, but President Obama doesn't know it. <laughs> Sorry, whoops, back we go. How do I go back? There we go. So Roy uh, says, Peppermint Patty, uh, I need some good advice. What do you do when something you've counted on doesn't happen? Well, here's something we counted on that didn't happen. Uh, here's Roy Spencer's famous diagram. Here's the mean of the models or the... Uh, I forget what they call it. What do they call it? Not the consensus of the models? Though. Anyway, ensemble. ensemble of the models. That's the black line. That's what temperature's meant to do. And down here we see the, the data, and of course it didn't warm at all. Well, that's a bit of a problem. So this thing I really believe was going to happen didn't happen. What do I do? Well, you can admit you're wrong. <laughs> Besides that, I mean... In those four words resides the wisdom of Solomon, and the wisdom of one of the greatest 20th century writers summarizes it. I know that most men, including those at ease with problems of the greatest complexity, can seldom accept even the simplest and most obvious truth if it be such as would oblige them to admit the falsity of conclusions which they have delighted in explaining to colleagues, which they have proudly taught to others, and which they have woven thread by thread into the fabric of their lives. Hold on, Jay. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not any longer a scientific problem. The scientists have done everything they can for you. The problem now is hubris and moral vanity amongst society's leadership, and especially amongst what we might call the left liberal set. To deal with that, you need, and remember this is a scientist saying this, it grieves me to my heart, but you need social scientists and you need political operators and people used to dealing with politics. Go to it, my friends. You've got five months until COP21 in Paris. Your job is not to challenge the science. It's to find ways around the moral vanity of our opponents. Thank you.